There is a great beauty in that which comes from the earth. There is a permanence and a deep sense of strength which has fascinated man since the beginning of time. He took these boulders and rocks and cut and shaped them. He took shells from the sea and adorned himself. He prayed with beads and felt empowered by their beauty. And thus began a connection as old as the earth itself. are everywhere. They are a part of our American culture. They are a part of our past and a part of our present. It's called Moroccan Spice. It's a 20 strand necklace. Absolutely gorgeous. Notice the bow tie clasp on it with all the different color gems in the golden tones. You're golden and you're curry and you're whether purchased by the wearer or given as a gift, beaded jewelry has always been valued. It enhances one's beauty and to many people acts as a measure of wealth. In Prescott, Arizona, there is a museum devoted to preserving the history of beads. In 1986, we opened here in this space. We're outgrowing it, but but it has done very well for us, and a lot of people are coming here to see it. It's uh, different from other collections because, as I say, it, it, uh, it covers a lot. We don't just specialize in the, in the top things. So, well, we don't have any jewelry in the sense of, of precious jewels. It's really more what the people wore. And that was our purpose, show history uh, of adornment in the sense of personal jewelry. Something hard to explain to people. If you say jewelry, they do expect precious gems. We have a lot of ancient beads from archaeological sources. When you hold those beads, you have the feeling that perhaps uh, you're holding history. It's such a personal thing that somebody has worn these and borne them through the ages. We have beads of, of all sorts of materials. We have necklaces and uh, we have uh, attachments, things that, anything that we can collect that would show uh, these things in the sense that they are important for one uh, in relation to another. People talk about museum quality. To some, perhaps, they wonder if something looks kind of beaten up, it's been worn for a long time. We don't change that. We don't try to improve it or in any way. We just try to show it how it was born. Across the country, many museums are beginning to recognize the global significance of beadwork. There are many traveling shows, such as this one at the Minge International Museum in San Diego, California. This show included beadwork from many perspectives and points in history, from beaded dresses and purses, to beaded African art. Through the generosity of private collectors, the world is able to benefit from the beauty of this art. My name is Benson Lanford, and I found beads when I was very young. One begins to see beads everywhere. Uh, my interest in Indians, though, has been the most important aspect of my life. Dances with the Wolves was uh, an important statement for American Indian people. Because of my interest in Indian people, I've collected photographs along with other things. The people who were putting together the costumes uh, came to me to borrow photographs in my collection. <clears throat> Largely, they based the quilled shirts on those photographs, but also a bear claw necklace in my collection, a Pawnee bear claw necklace, was used as the prototype 
for the Pawnee necklace that was made for the, the movie. Where there are Indians, there are beads. But then one learns that beads are used by everybody in the world. And there's real magic in beads, so you can't ignore them. But looking at um, spread out on the floor, which is my usual working space, is a part of my study collection of beads. And I feel it is really important for anyone that is serious about collecting and studying beads to have a study collection. You have beads that you can compare to others. The one that's in my right hand is what you call open work, because as you can see, the uh, cloisons are only partially filled. And this other one is one of my favorite, a tabular one, with a dragon on one side and the phoenix on the other. Now these particular beads are also powder glass beads. These are part of a dying tradition in Mauritania. These particular beads are only made by women. They're incredibly complex. What the women do is take various colors of glass, some from beads, others from European glass sources, crush them, arrange them in a palette, and then mixing a little bit of saliva with it, they then take the point of a needle and apply these colors onto a glass core that they have made themselves. And this is all done by firing in a little oven that consists no more than of a inverted sardine can. And these are the so-called Roman mosaic face beads. These were made around, the, uh, this particular type was made around 100 BC to 100 AD. One of the reasons why people collect material from contemporary ethnographic sources or ancient sources is because they're trying to learn more about the culture and about the people that use these. Well, I think that if, if bead research weren't being conducted in the professional and educated manner that it is, it would be so easy to think of beads as nothing more than frivolous ornaments. And beads are really much more important than that in terms of their history and their universal appeal. Through the bead, you see the whole of history. It's a wonderful tool for understanding trade, for understanding technique. For, I mean, this is his multidisciplinary, for understanding uh, cultural values in a society, how people combine them, let you know what their aesthetic values are. I like Joan Erickson's idea that, that uh, one of the reasons subconsciously we appreciate beads is because they remind us of our mother's eyes. Yes, I do too. Special rods are prepared for bead making. Glass is heated by an open flame fueled manually by bellows. The glass is melted onto the coated rods. Sometimes the beads are adorned with other beads or bits of glass. Rough edges are smoothed away. Once the beads are made, they are cooled in water. After they're cooled, they can be pulled off the rods. The beads are tumbled to remove imperfections. They are placed in the sun to dry. They are then sorted by size, dried completely, and package to be sold. The Czechs are well known for the quality of their beads. To make glass beads, one needs to start with glass rods. Over 400 tons are processed into beads each year. Some of these are made in large factories and some by local craftsmen. The first step in this process is to make a mold. There are over 3,000 basic bead shapes. After the beads have been pressed into shape, they are polished in drums. English or satin beads are made by the more traditional glass grinding method. Designs are cut directly into the rods. To make seed beads, 
Rods are constructed with the holes already in them. They are cut to size, polished, and then strung. On the coast off of Japan, the cultured pearl industry thrives. Specially grown oysters are prepared to grow cultured pearls. Bits of tissue and mother of pearl pellets are implanted. This stimulates a response by the oyster's immune system. Layers of nacre coat the implant. After two to three years, the nacre is thick enough for the pearl to be harvested. The pearls are then sorted, drilled, and ready for stringing. They are then ready to be sold. I'm going to be making a little bead out of Pyrex glass. These are stainless steel rods that have been coated with a special bead release. I'll just bring in a piece of glass, wrap it right on, and over that I'm going to put a little bit of this turquoise. I have another glass rod. This has a little bit of gold on the end. Get this warm, and then I'll stick it on the table to pick up the gold. In heating the gold in the flame, it will vaporize, and then it will recondense onto the surface of the bead, giving a little bit of a metallic finish. And I'll overcoat that with clear. So will trap the gold down inside. There's a whole little universe inside the bead itself. And then this goes over into a bead annealer. Keep it from cracking. And in a few hours, that comes out, and we'll have a bead. To me, it's, it's not what I do like 100% of the time, but it's what I do probably more for relaxing than anything else. And because I do casting and blown glass, fused, slumped, you know, a little bit of everything. And so I like to just get on the torch and I almost let the, the bead tell me what to do, what to make. And I think that's the fun part about it for me is that I really don't have a clue what I'm going to do when I sit down. And uh, all of a sudden the molten glass just starts kind of dictating, you know, what it wants to become. About four years ago, Glenda came and said, let's go look at beads. Beads? Okay, we went and looked at beads. And we were in uh, uh, Tempe and went into a, a, a fairly large bead shop. And uh, we walked in, and it was just like a world of beads on every wall, everywhere, beads. And I walked in, and I thought, oh, my goodness. I was so happy that I took my MasterCard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since then, I've been bead addicted, and shortly thereafter, um, I took uh, a lampwork bead class. Well, we kind of buy into each other's addiction. Glenda makes the bead heads, which are fantastic. I'm more of uh, making the simple uh, little small beads. And we go back and forth, teaching each other things that we've learned or discovered. All in all, it's a load of fun. Hi, I'm John. Rocky from Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm a glass artist, and I'm going to share with you my uh, dichro wrapped glass pendant. Each one of these pendants requires three firings, and then you have these nice little pendants that uh, uh, really you can wear either way. This stuff is incredible in the full sunlight. Hi, I'm Cheryl Orahood. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, I do hot glass work. I am a fuser. I've been doing this about um, six years. One nice thing about this kind of glass is that I can make different kinds of jewelry out of it. Being a silversmith and a goldsmith 20 years ago, I decided that I would put this back in to use with my glass. You can also do wire wrap with it. This is really kind of fun to do because you never know what it's going to come out like. We started small, and now our business has grown to a, a pretty big business with uh, Oh, varies from six to eight employees. I do most of the drawings and the concept of the inlay itself and the colors. Like, what I really love is color. And then together, I think we, we make just this incredible <coughs> team because I will do the color and I will do the drawings up, and then he does the metal work, and somehow it just makes this, like, magical thing. And all Most turquoise beads are actually any bead, shell beads, Beads of any kind pretty much start out as a, as a flat piece or a flat rectangle or a disc with a diamond drilled hole in it. I'm going to drill a hole in this. 
Has to be done underwater to keep the diamond cool. Simple as that. Beads are put on the wire and graduated as to their size. And this is a little sample piece that'll give an idea of how beads are made. Once again, back to the grindstone. There's an example of the rounded edge bead. This is the rough what you start with, the cylinders that you've turned down to be balanced, and then the sanded donuts that are so popular now in the jewelry today. The jelly roll is a real famous, um, that's a basic, a real basic cane that everyone does, but it actually is one of my favorites because it, um, if you put the colors together the right way, it really, um, it has a brilliant look when you finish with, when you finish completing the bead. I also have gotten into mixing them with, um, mixing the clay beads along with glass beads, and those I'm finding are coming out really, really pretty as well. But I think the, um, the ones that are just on the, the rope by themselves, I like those. Those are my favorite because they accent the bead a lot. My grandfather he used to do this business back in Middle East, and then my father, then my brothers, oldest brothers, and I'm the youngest one in the family. We came over to the state about 25 years ago, and my father, he said, let's start up the same business what we used to have back there. We started up here, so I started up, and it's been, I've been in business about 20 years now in the same location, and we're doing fine, and I'm trying to keep everything always in the stock. And if something I don't have, I always check with my brothers around uh, Montreal or in England, London, and Saudi Arabia. Jewelry people and garment people and clothing manufacturers, they come and buy from me. Many people buy their beads at trade and gem shows. Quartzsite is a small town in central Arizona, usually peaceful, but every February millions of people come to buy beads. Dealers come from around the world to sell their beads. Everybody is doing beads now, and uh, we have customers who are hobbyists, some are designers. And then we have other wholesale customers also who have been buying all these beads. I don't dress like this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and if that's not enough, one can always move on to Tucson, where there's plenty more beads for sale. I believe strongly that everybody has their own eye, and I think it just develops. And I think that's why you see such a variety of work, because everybody has their own eye. Hands are just a um, favorite part of my collection. It's just a personal thing. I put them, a lot of them into the pieces that I reproduce, and I have them in all kinds of metals, bones and ivories and shells, and uh, from all over the world. And I just love hands. Eight, nine years ago, I started uh, seed beating when I was watching the tribal elders in Suquamish, which is an Indian reser reservation in uh, Washington state. I like to do things really close with my hands. Once I have the design and the pattern that I want, and it pleases me, and it makes me feel like, oh, okay, this is going to work, these colors go together, then I can go with it. I actually started working with beads about three years ago. I would find myself looking at something and going, I would really like that, but you know, I'd really like to have that in the middle of it. And I love earrings. I've, you know, in, in my career, I mean, a lot of people who follow, especially the Ford commercials and things, I have this big earring thing. But I love making necklaces and putting things together. And I go to my tray and all these different beads and things I have, and I just start pulling from my gut. I don't think about it in my head. I like putting the cultures together, too, because I think that's a, a critical thing. I think when people look at it, it's fun for them to be, oh, they respond to the whole thing. And, and, and you know, with all of our racial and religious differences and problems that we're having today, um, I think that's a real important thing to be wearing 
an expression of, of unity and how beautifully all those cultures can go together. I can go maybe a week or two, once a year, without doing any beating. Otherwise, I start, I got to beat something, I got to beat something. <laughs> So it's, it's an addiction for me, and one of the reasons it's a great addiction is because it combines two things I love most, shopping and creating. I'm always coming up with new designs and new ideas. And what I like to do is come up with a new design and then teach a class in it. Well, I've been doing beadwork for six or seven years now, uh, although I profess a lifelong uh, affinity and uh, addiction to jewelry. A peyote stitch is probably my favorite. I have three or four necklaces that are done in a freeform peyote. You just use whatever bead you have. You, uh, the, bead, the necklace goes in its own direction. Shields and Yarnell, that's I'm Shields, was a famous mime team and uh, we won Emmys and we had our own TV series. And uh, I actually was uh, the first street mime in San Francisco. I created the robot. So it's very fascinating using mime and dance and rhythm and all this kind of stuff combined. I put it all in my artwork you now. I deal with every kind of animal from eagles to turtles to horses to you know, a celestial to southwest to angels to modern to, you know, it's every kind of topic I'm involved with because I'm fascinated by it all to make it all in my own universe as far as kind of a tribal, new primitive kind of South American, Colombian, southwest look. You have to look at a bead and then you have to think to yourself, what is a bead? What really is a bead? And a bead is anything with a hole in it. So therefore, the ozone must be a, a giant bead. I, I don't take myself seriously. In fact, I'm a member of the Controlled Insanity Group. We're insane, but we have a lot of discipline about it. I um, trim shoes like this. It was plain first, and I just add what I like, and that's generally what my customer likes because I do sing professionally and I try to add a little something that's going to be casual as well as fun and comfortable to give me a little flair. There's something that someone old, someone young, someone middle-aged can wear, you know, to add a little spice to their life, I guess you could say. I became really fascinated with beads and with fiber arts when I was a kid. I had other beads and buttons and this was just, the connection was always there, that there was always beauty to be made and uh, beauty to be had. I loved beads because they were small, they were portable, you could find them any number of places. And the more I learned about them, I found that there, this was a connection. Hi, my name is Becky Lloyd, and these are my ladies that I do. Fused glass and then a lot of beads that I incorporate into the hair and earrings. These are my fun girls. I work with each individual face to incorporate the beads to make a final finished product. And the face itself and the wire and the hair dictates what I'm going to do. In, in our classes, something that's so satisfying from creating a necklace, just a simple single strand necklace, is that um, that process of going from where you have a plate of a mixture of beads, which I call the chaos phase, just a whole jumble of all colors and sizes and shapes, chaos. And you take that chaos through transformation as you begin to put a necklace together to unity. In the end, when it's done, you have something complete, and it has meaning beyond words. Across the country, many people join bead societies to trade techniques and information. The New Mexico Bead Society is well known for its lively meetings and riveting workshops, like this one taught at the Stone Mountain Bead Gallery. The reason why photography is so important is because without good photographs, you cannot publish good articles. Here you see on the screen a small view of a two-page spread. And you can see, when you look at this magazine, 
that this is exactly the same as that, only this is now at the final size. And so this gives you an idea of what present-day desktop publishing is about. New technology has found its way into the oldest of art forms. Websites like this one for the Center of Bead Research, founded by Peter Francis, Jr., give information about beads. The Bead Bugle is another popular source for bead lovers who own computers. It is said that beads symbolize man's link with God. We are all the beads of the earth, and God is the thread that holds us together. Beads connect us to the earth, and let us aspire to the heavens. I had a wonderful opportunity to work six months with Dalai Lama's sister uh, in a refugee home for children. And I can remember I was out there with my little ten dollars or whatever it was I had, and I got a bead, a beautiful coral bead. Well, I had to go down to Delhi to get supplies, and when I did, I went right to this little man in Sundarnagar Market that I bought beads from, and I showed it to him, and he said, this must be from His Holiness's party. He said, this is a beautiful bead. 